Welcome to Inner Power Particles. I'm Farhat, the host of the podcast. We talk with entrepreneurs and leaders about how they have solved the challenges in their life or business and how it has transformed into new inner strength in them. And with this we want to help that you also can look at your life or business situations and see how you can solve the challenges in them and through that transform them also into new inner strengths, inner power particles in you. Enjoy the show. Hi Andrin, thank you for coming to the interview. Awesome. Awesome to be here, thank you. I want to start with a simple question, hopefully simple to answer. Can you share what do you do today? Oh, I'm a father of three and a CEO at the same time. So what it means during evening time, I manage kids and my family and just make sure that there's happiness in my life. And at the same time, during the day and sometimes during the night, make sure that uh, employees and customers are satisfied. So I've delivered the product, be up to speed, and deliver the highest value to them. So we are a CEO and father of three. Yes. Can you share what does the company do? So I'm the founder of a company called Monetizer. Monetizer is in-game advertising platform. It's basically, we work with top mobile game studios who produce amazing video games, and we help them to monetize their content with a brand and experience, which is the second part of our platform. Who are the top brand advertisers like Tide, Secret, Febreze, these consumer packaged goods that sponsor and enhance experience for the gamers inside the game. And that's how we make the enjoyable experiences for the end user. Yeah. What type of games are we talking about? We're talking about specifically mobile. And in mobile, those are super simplistic games. They're called in hyper-casual category. So there's like five to 10 minutes of gameplay where brands can enhance experience for the user to get to the next level, get more points, unlock exclusive content inside the game. Uh Uh-huh. And how long have you been doing this? So we founded the company in 2016. And so we had three near-death experiences. That was like super challenging, but only... In the last two years, we discovered like, hey, we're actually onto something. And that's, that's very exciting. Yeah. We have also another episode with your co-founder. So I have a <laughs> bit of inside knowledge already. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, also, for me, interesting to hear these two perspectives. And for people who are watching or listening also, it would be interesting to, to also listen to that episode with your co-founder, Mark. Okay. Um, you mentioned uh, three near-death experiences. I hope you're speaking about the company. Yes, about the company. So like I'm thinking on a company perspective. Like, one of that was like where my co-founder was in San Francisco and he had $87 in, in the bank account. So it means he can't fly back to Riga, Latvia, where we are coming from. And we had to figure out overnight, how can we get money and survive? And that's the mentality through those uh, couple of experiences that we've been through. So always low on cash, we don't know what will tomorrow bring to us and how we will survive through that. True uncertainty field, fog, we don't know where to go, what's next. That has been the most difficult until we got to this point when we found, hey, we have the signals of product market fit, and this is where we are today. So seven years and you are now in the place where you feel that you have product market fit signals, yes? Yes, yes, indeed. And this is for average experience story that I've heard, this is longer than people would be ready to go in the same company, right? Oh, there are also, of course, all sorts of exceptions, but I feel you're also one of those. Yeah, indeed. Like uh, people give up. Yeah, giving up is easy. And also it's very difficult to say, hey, it's, it, I'm pausing right now. I'm making conscious decision that I will not move ahead with the business. And we had a couple of discussions with my co-founder about this. Hey, we're doing something, but we don't have any traction. Like my wife calls for my attention. Like, hey, come home. We have to have family life. Bring money home. <laughs> bring, bring money home as well. So, you know, we don't have money. We have no cash almost. So we have to figure out how to survive yeah. as individuals. And also we have to make a decision. Okay, what's, what's next? But throughout these experiences, what we've truly known is that it's not that, that the grit, yes, we did not give up. Typical companies might give up. But there's one learning that I found from Y Combinator, uh, one of the partners, when I had a like, mentorship session with them. They said, every day you survive as a founder, you increase chances of being successful. And that's, there you go. <laughs> Let's increase the opportunity for us to, to be successful. And every time we saw, well, if we mix this grit together with this insight that we have, this truly still is to, to this day from when we found it to now, 
It's about like gamification, about enhancing user experience. And it's still true from the first idea to now, it's still there. We only just realized that we have to build a lean canvas and fill each blank with a re relative solution that will solve that. Yeah. So that's, that's something that is, it took us, why we're still exciting today. Let's jump off the cliff now and explore the topic of giving up or not giving up. So, meaning in retrospect for people, it's easy to look at you and say, yeah, but now you are here and for you, it's easy to talk that not give up and be determined and whatnot. But you know, my situation is so much difficult. Yes. And, and <laughs> so much different. So how, uh, let's take even easier route. Let's say there's someone uh, four to five years uh, had been struggling, uh, not uh, business, not picking up, uh, yeah. no considerable traction runway running out, feeling yeah, everything's going depressed to or crash, whatnot. no like, tomorrow. Like, yeah, like how even do you know, like, should I keep now pushing through the walls or should I just ah, throw it all on the floor and bankruptcy and just, I don't know, try to start another thing because the cap table also doesn't look nice at that moment already. So. The more you don't know what to do, the more difficult it gets. What got us through was because I had an amazing co-founder and we had the same mentality about, hey, we, we want to build something together and we're very excited about the space where we are in. If we would not be excited about the space, hey, this gamification, monetization, that's the name of the company, monetize it, like help game studios to make more money. We were the ones who had this problem to begin with. We were trying for ourselves. We said, okay, let's do this. Okay, it doesn't work, okay. We will not help ourselves. So let's, let's figure out another way and another way and another way. And every time it's coming back to the basic, which is, yeah, we're excited about this. That's why it's, we did not give up. Meaning the, what you're saying is that the area in which you are working, even if you would completely fail, you would start a new venture, most probably in a similar Area, so why start and you just continue the yes. one you have? Yes, in a sense. And another thing is that, not the thing, but another aspect is that you have a co-founder with whom you somehow, how is it like, are you both optimists and determined guys or oh, yeah. one is more <laughs> supporting the other? How is it? It depends which day we're talking about. Is it Monday <laughs> or Tuesday? <laughs> and, 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 and throughout the years, the same way. So I think we're both optimists in, in the 10,000 feet perspective. Yeah. But on a day-to-day, -day, on a ground level, we're challenging each other. How do we know that this thing that we're doing, is this hypothesis really true? Is it worth like 80-20 principle that I learned the hard way? Hey, we just lost one year of our lives by doing things that we actually don't believe in. That was some of the things that we pivoted into the blockchain, for example. I was like, oh, hype. And investors might be interested. We see potential solution. But when we talk to customer eventually to game studio what is blockchain again like what does it do for me well, I no I need practical it. solutions so yes. total ways so so you can have this awesome idea and say you know i kind of love new technology and it's cool but you don't have that same energy from the customer so it's okay just hypotheses and just challenging each other until we prove ourselves that we're right and slowly by slowly we're proving each block and having uh, from lean canvas perspective and then Getting more confirmation, yes, problem. We can write a book almost about the problem. The customer segment, hey, we have now like a, a multiple pages and, and customer team members know everything about our customer right now. The next one is value proposition, relationships, channels, business mo model, what's our resources, etc. So now we have much more a higher confidence and I think that's why we can say we're closer to product market fit or have signals towards that. Well, you also have a proper gamble as a client and massive, coming in. Massive. So easy to say from this perspective, so what if we know roll back a couple of years ago when you didn't have that all. So five years in the business, no customers, no revenue. How was it then? What was it? You know, it's not like that. It's typically from one stage to another, we have some legacy revenue. We have oh. legacy issues as well. So yeah. good things and bad things. When we decided to pivot, we actually went back to the basics. We said, hey, let's go back and talk to game studios again. Yeah. And again, and again, and it sounds so trivial that, hey, talk to customers. But in fact, you have to talk to customers until we did not know what we are doing. They suggested what we have to do. I've heard uh, from founders this phrase that I feel tired. And 
when I asked, what do you mean with that? Have you not slept or have you not taken vacation? No, I feel tired from these X years of doing the work with no traction. This is kind of draining me out. Yeah. So totally. How, how about you? <laughs> I understand them. Yeah, I, I can say I, I feel tired as well. But am I tired to give it give up or am I tired because of the marathon? And this is just like kilometer number 30, just like 10% there, let's go. Yeah. No, I mean, like in monitors, in case you are climbing up, you are not going. As I say, the railway, which goes very horizontally all the time, <laughs> as far as you can see. Yeah, we're going up the field for sure, well, for yeah. so, some time. What we've seen throughout the, the years, why we're not giving up, is because pushing that boulder was more difficult when we tested initial idea. When we said, hey, we're doing this blockchain thing, right? We're pushing, nobody's buying. Like we push, we can push as much as we can, but nobody's pulling. So there's no, yeah, we gave up on the idea, but not on the, on the trajectory of what we're doing. And since we pivoted to the uh, in-game advertising, what happened was that we dropped bits and pieces of our hypotheses and we saw that we don't have to push anymore. Some of the brands are saying, hey, tell me more. I want to jump on a meeting. Yeah. Just a small signal like that helped us to say, hey, now we're finally on to something. And we went to the game studio. They said, hey, let's do, instead of what we did back then, let's put brand sponsored experiences in the game. Yeah, sounds good. And out of that, we deconstructed. How can we confirm this uh, hypothesis? Because money would come from the brands. Previously, our model was that game studios are paying us for rewards and gift cards for the consumers. And, and that's why we talked to them. Hey, they're paying us, we have to listen. But instead they said, hey, you know what? We have 98% of users who don't pay us money. Why do you focus on this one or 2% who are just whales? Yeah, they're big ones. They make mo most amount of money, but those 98%, like that's the... Mm -hmm. And but, that's how we discovered. Yeah. How, but what happened uh, with your cap table on the road? Because if it's like seven years... Uh... Yeah, so, so of course, as a founder, it's very difficult to... It's like every time you pivot, you try to extend it. Throughout the years, we always been in the cockroach mode. What can we do not to uh, spend money? So let's pay as little salaries as possible. Yeah, my wife is not happy about that, but it's about like getting to the end goal, not saying that, hey, we're not gonna go do good things in the beginning. It's a long game, let's, let's focus on that. And this is where uh, myself and my co-founder agreed on, that hey, we're okay to play this kind of a game. We don't like it now, but hopefully we'll like it in the future. So that was very hard. But now, if I re look back at our cap table, in fact, it's a benefit because every investor who we have on a cap table has some kind of a network. And in order to build relationships with the top brand advertisers and top agencies, they have someone in their network, at least one person mm -hmm. who can help us with warm introduction. And guess what? Like now we have Zoom early employees, people from Intuit, from Berkeley Angel Network, from, from many, many powerful angels with the powerful network. Typically, strategy would be, hey, I raised some money and I work with investors. But practically, our investors are our resource, how we open the doors. And that's, yeah, that's not scalable. But now, from zero to one, that's the way how to open the doors and we're using it pretty much every day. Mm -hmm. So you'll see it as a benefit that you have many yes. investors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because how I understand is that why people decide to fall down the companies, either they understand, okay, the industry is not mine, actually. All right, this is a different case. But if they think, okay, the industry is mine, but the cap table doesn't look good anymore. I just need to reset. Does, it's not very nice, actually, to the investors. But on the other hand, if the founders have diluted so much that there's no vested interest for them, then this could also be understood. Yeah, technically, we could also do this kind of a thing as well, fold the company. Well, the thing that we raised money for, it didn't succeed. But I think all the investors who helped us along the way, they helped us with a little something that helped us to steer towards the right direction. Yeah. And that's why we're grateful for that. And we didn't want to say, hey, no. Yeah, now we have a more difficult situation when we close the $4 million seed. 
but now I think we're in an excellent spot. That this this is a propeller. I didn't realize that this this negative thing can turn into the positive. Of mm-hmm. course, we have to go grow through the stage where we are now into the money is piling in the bank account based on Horowitz's yeah. uh, definition. That's that's our goal. So I know that you have raised ground. You have a quite good runway now. How do you make sure that you make the right decision about how you use those resources? Because, well, many founders celebrate rising seed round, but from them, big proportion do not get to celebrate the next round. It, it just don't. Yeah, it's always there. Raising money is not the milestone. Like, in fact, there's nothing to celebrate. You just diluted your company. <laughs> yeah. so, 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 but you got capital. Yeah, you know, of, of course. But in a sense, that's nothing to celebrate. That's not a big success. It's just, yeah, you have a booster. Yeah, you can go faster. You can get more people toward the result. But in fact, the real result is, hey, we got a customer and customers loves our product. That's mm-hmm. something to celebrate. So I think the attention should be raising money. You get some press. Oh, people call you, congratulate you. Well, that's like the small win. Why you, you, you asked about giving up. When you have this kind of a small win and people call you, you feel like, yeah, I did something. And in fact, you did not do anything. Just like appreciate that small win, but focus on the customer success. And just when the customer really says, I love working with you and you're doing an amazing job, that's, that's the energy driver. So you're saying that uh, the primary goal of this capital that you raised is to get more customers and serve them better. Indeed, so? yes. So we have one gigantic corporation using our company products. So what we have to do, yes, we've talked with L'Oreal, yes, we've talked with Bayer, Vella, McDonald's, and with digital agencies from Dentsu to WPP. We see early interest from them, but we haven't closed it. We haven't closed it because we have been limited in resources. I, or my co-founder, we were the ones who were doing the sales. Now we want to prove that somebody else can sell it. And that moves closer to product market fit. Oh, somebody else in our organization can repeat what we did. Okay, let's build this repeatability in the, in the system. So now we want to do slowly by slowly prove some of these points towards product market fit. Yes, one is the repeatability in sales. Second one would be repeatability in cons- uh, uh, brand spending. You will see that through net revenue retention increase. You will see through the density, through the K factor virality. So those will be then elements that we haven't cracked it out right now. And that's the goal, what we want to do. So get more resources in the sales perspective, sales and marketing, because we have since spent zero dollars on marketing, literally. Now it's an opportunity to test channels. And how we will know that we are a product market fit, we will test in multiple channels. We'll know which what's the customer acquisition cost per channel and what's the value, what's our margins, how we are making, is it sustainable, is it repeatable? And typically companies from C to Series A, they fail, they overspend, and they're not diligent with probably burning more and not testing effectively. And Series A might only happen when you have repeatability on the channel unit economics and everything is repeatable. And only then we can raise Series A. Sounds very, everything uh, very reasonable what you're sharing. Logic, yeah. Uh, (laughs) And I think there are many founders who are same reasonable as you, and they have folded their companies okay. after, after seed round. And I wonder, what is your how? I mean, how do you make sure that you make the best decisions? And with the best, I mean, the ones that are most likely to lead you to where you want to get. So when we were, a couple of reasons why we had the first near-death experiences, we made decisions ourselves. Like I made the decision, hey, let's do this. I made the decision where we have to go. In fact, that's wrong. I have assumption that we should go somewhere. Yeah. And I should seek for advice, feedback, and confirmation. Is my hypothesis true or not true? And that is arrogant. Like, I don't, I, I, I'm true. I know what I'm doing. No, I'm not. I don't, in fact. And probably that could be a one learning, at least for me. So now we know, okay, this, this customer, we know it. We know consumer packaged goods companies likes us. Now let's repeat it. Let's prove this hypothesis. Okay, uh, this is maybe already, the, I will call it simple level, meaning if you want to make decisions about sales, 
do not ask your friends, but ask your potential customers. Yes. yes? It's obvious. And, no, and also... Not, not for everyone, but this is obvious. But now, the not so obvious part is, for example, do we hire or we don't hire? Whom we hire? Oh, how we lead, yeah. how we not lead. Yes, so how, how we delegate, how we make decisions in the company. I, I mean, this is more the area where you can, yeah. what's the polite word, screw up things. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, I hope we are not screwing up. And that's why we have awesome mentors to guide us if we uh, fail. And that's what I'm referring to. Sometimes I know what I know and I don't know what I don't know. Yeah. And if I ask my team to put in just recommendation, what do you guys think? What should be the next key results? Like we want to get more pilots, how we'll measure if we're successful or not. What do you think? And now, now I see, oh, I saw only like half of the things and there's some new half of the things coming on from the team members. And I lost the same question from our uh, board. A lot from mentors who are open-minded to help us. And our multiple perspectives also from the customer. How do you know that we will be successful for you? How can we celebrate your success? I've read this in the book, but now we're practicing. Is that understand what they want, how to get their promotion. And that's what we, well, it's a very difficult to do to understand what, how we could get their promotion. But if we honestly, within the company, think about our customers, persona, promotion, everything that, every decision would help us to get towards that place. Yeah. So that's the alignment we got within a team and just getting this radical transparency, open, being open-minded, having this challenging environment that everyone can challenge CEO. It doesn't mean that I know everything. It's about right idea that has proved facts wins, not my decision or someone's decision. So I think that's kind of a culture that we have built. Uh, maybe it's different in other uh, early stage companies. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't call you already early stage company. Um, I want to ask you uh, another dimension is cooperation with the people in the team. You are two co-founders in the yes. team and you have also some other long-term team members. Yes. Uh, I'm curious, I, and I will throw out both questions. One is how do you all make sure that you collaborate with your co-founder in the best possible way? And how do you differentiate collaboration with other long-term team members who are with you for years already, so and who are either already are or will be the C-level of the company? So first things first, before we hired anyone or hiring now, we say that, you know, every one of us will be replaceable at some point. It doesn't mean that if you start now, you will be the see something at later stage. We have to get the product market fit and then we'll see how the organization will build itself. So that's first things first to answer. So we talk with my co-founder practically daily or every other day at least. I don't know, just anything. Like, how was your anything like lunch, dinner and to how was the last customer call? Like, what did you learn? Surprisingly, I always have something to talk about. There's something new that I learned and something I can share with him. And there's dialogue happening constantly. It's from 10 minutes to two hours nonstop. So that's something that is going on. With the early stage employees, it's about what they can help us to get us to the next stage, to understand their drivers, their motivations. And they're also, they think about the personal self-development. When they started, they maybe just designer. Now they're lead designer. So the skill sets is expanding. One of the values that we have, who we hire for, is per, uh, continuous development. So we have unlimited access to books. So any books you want to buy, hey, we'll, we'll buy it for you so, so that you can keep learning, keep involving as a human being. And that's awesome because that will help these people earn the C-level spot, not just because they're early, but yeah. because they have the actual skill and have grown into that role. How, but, but how do you di differentiate which types of discussions and decisions you make with the co-founder and which ones with whole C level? Typically, we have a quick chit chat. Like, what do you feel about this? Like, what's your gut feel says about it? Are we on the right path? Yes or no? With the co-founder? Yes, with... yes. Yeah. As I'm having my own thoughts, the same thoughts I'm having with Kim is that just like, hey, what do you think of this or that? Yeah. And then we are, yeah, you know, 
we're on the same page or we might disagree, then we say, you know what, this, these are a couple of things. Let's ask team members to, to, to jump in and then talk about it. But in fact, if, if a year ago, or maybe two years ago, we were making decisions, uh, just two of us, mm -hmm. now it's not the same, that's not anymore. So we have team leads meeting uh, where we come with the ideas, but we don't make a decision. We, we come to the group and I might suggest the decision. I have hypotheses and why, but everyone in the meeting can suggest what they think about that. And then we do a quick vote. So on a two week basis, we make, hey, we have to make a budget decision now. We have to make a decision about this hiring or pivoting or increasing the prices, whatever that subject would be. So it's an evolution of how you make decisions in the company. And as the company will grow bigger and the importance of the yes. non-founder C-level execs will grow, then the decision-making also will switch from the founder's level to the C-level, mostly with time. Well, one thing that we're trying to practice recently and talk about it, what if we hit, get hit by a bus? Like, will the company still operate? <clears throat> So meaning, like, if I get hit by a bus, like, I'll not be, well, myself and Martin's my co-founder, is away. Will this still be working? Yeah. Yes or no? And if the answer is no, then, okay, let's figure out, should we fix it now? Should we fix it later? Yeah. Uh, who should be involved? What's the system behind it? Even though we're small, but there's a mini system of that that could self-involve and develop over time. Mm -hmm. But in the stage which is even post product market fit, because then the next also is figuring out the go to market and reach the go to market fit. I think it's just inevitable if founders get hit by a bus, then most probably the company is also hit by a bus in those stages. Well, what we want to build here is that we, we want to build the car consciousness. Customer consciousness is very difficult. It's to hire for and say, hey, you think now about customer, how sh he, she will get promoted. But what we did just a month, month or two ago, we shipped all our customer, like all, all our team members to, to Cologne, to Games Conference. Yeah. And say, hey, go and speak with the customers. We will equip you with tools. This is how you pitch. Let me, let me go there. Let me have a conversation, but you will see how I'm doing it. And after minutes of 60, 90 minutes, they were actually well equipped themselves. So it's about that giving or leading. And now they will be the ones who will hire for their roles and they will be able to replicate and show it. So we have to lead by example, if, if that's the saying. But yeah, that's what we're trying to do. And I lead by example and show what's the consciousness of the decision making. Where, what kind of a decision should we be making and thinking about? You also mentioned how your leadership style now is a bit different compared to how it was. Can you elaborate more now? If you would compare yourself today and two years ago, how are you different in way how you're leading the company? Everything is different. And, and uh, <laughs> maybe in also broader, how have you changed and what's, what's different for you? So first things first, we have like two weeks sprint cycle. Doesn't sound anything fancy, but we have uh, sales and product teams and they collaborate. What I learned from David Sachs that just about this, how to operate a late stage company. So they had four teams and we distilled down to two. And with essentially sales and product team, they iterate in this like endless cycle where a sales team gets some feedback from the market, they give it to the product team, product teams hears it, oh, let's implement this, oh, this is the bug, let's fix it. At the same time, product team ships something, that's something that sales team can go and execute. So it's constant uh, feedback from one to another. And this creates this flow of information. We didn't have it before. It was just us giving signals, collecting information. So it's linear. Yeah. Now it's like a cycle. Okay. It's, what it, it's one, one big change. Now we have team lead meetings to make a big decision. So it's like everything, if we have anything, we put in the calendar and just have a quick call and quick meeting during the team lead chats. And then we make a quick decision. We didn't have those before. Maybe it slows down a bit, but now as we get into the speed, into the pace, now the team starts to make conscious decisions. And I think that's a good, good way of improvement. Previously, the founders only made the decision. Everything else probably includes... How you have... What is different for you? For if you me, would look at yourself compared now and two years, like 
approximately two years. What the team members said, the biggest change in the team was me. So <laughs> <You'll>... <laughs> that was that was like, oh wow, thank you. I didn't realize that I have changed. Probably I had. I have listened. Although I'm very ambitious and I, I want that my opinion wins, now I start to understand that actually I'm not the smartest in the room and I have to give microphone to the team members. I, yes, I have to come up with the initiative with that energy and that gets them excited. Yes, I, that's still what I do today, but not with the final thought or not with the final word or final saying. That's up to them to decide. Mm -hmm. If that's answered the question <laughs> for one of them. Yes, I'm curious about anything concerning you personally. So what you're saying is that you are uh, now not considering that you are the smartest in the room. There are then two situations, either you are not or you are. Meaning when you are an early stage startup, then it could be that you are a generalist that indeed has a good knowledge in many verticals. And it might be that although there is this mantra, hire people who are smarter yeah. than you in their roles, well, there could be a situation that you do not have such people. In some cases, you feel smarter. Uh, yeah. Have you experienced this? And if yes, how do you approach the situation? Meaning that, I don't know, let's take what a programming or product or finance, and then the, your subordinate uh, team members has done a work, and then you see you could do it like yeah, I 30 do, percent I, better. I, I then do it then better. what do you do? Well, it's very hard. It's very hard to put your mouth where it should be. There are things that are important and there are things that are less important. In the areas that I know, I, I could be the best one to make a decision. Probably when project we can assign to the project and I know most about this project, then I will lead that project and I will say, hey, this is the direction. If I'm not the lead of that project or someone else is the lead, they should be the ones who make, make the call on the decision, even though I'm, I'm there just to support it. What we encourage, when I mentioned before, is this kind of devil's advocate hat, just challenger. Hey, everyone is open to challenge whether or not I'm, and, and that's regards to me and to everyone else. So if, if I, if someone else is a team lead on, on, the, on that project and I'm not the lead team lead, I would challenge them. Hey, is it, have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? And do that respectfully, giving feedback without harsh language, just the knowledge of how to give feedback. There's a way to do it. Previously, I did not know how to do it. Just like screaming out, that, out loud. <laughs> it's like, that was, that, was, that was me. I made this kind of a mistake. And that's yeah. why people hated working with me. Now I learned that and, and I adjusted. But respecting them and just giving them the tools, but yeah, of course, there's sometimes a situation, but you know, I would do this way. What we do now is have one-on-one. -on -one. We previously didn't have those. One-on-ones yeah. is basically me listening to them, their problems and them asking support. How can I help? How can I assist? Or maybe ask for my opinion. And at the same time, I'm asked for permission. Can I share my perspective about like, well, you did this project. Would you be interested? Hear my point of view. And if they agree on that, then I'll happily share what's on a high level. And if needed, I'll give details what I would, how I would be doing that. But I'm trying to consciously avoid explaining how to do it. Although yeah. sometimes I might be the one who, who has the knowledge. Yeah. I'm a, not in the past, but in the last already several years, I'm a big advocate of outcome-based management. Meaning that, let's say we have a, let's say we have a CPO. And then there's a product and the product, I'm not speaking about the big decisions like which segment it's serving or what, but let's say features level. And now the CEO looks at the features that the CPO is going to approve. And, oh, I don't like this. I would like to change these things. But what the CEO should be actually thinking about at that moment, is it aligned with the vision that we are going after and will it help? to keep the NPS high or whatever similar yeah, metric you're the core metric yes. yeah, what's that? And then you are not bothering with going to the CPO and saying, hey, remove this uh, feature from the sprint and I don't like it. Yeah. Because this is already someone messing up with the CPO's competence. Yeah, that makes sense. So well, how can I understand this question and respond back is as a CEO, my job is to protect the vision. So that's, I will do everything to protect that. 
And yeah. sometimes it might contradict that the CPO needs to make a decision whether this or that needs to be in the, in the feature set. So first things first, like if there's mis- disagreement, we don't know, everybody has their own opinion. Let's have a conversation about that. Let's get the points across. What kind of a data do you have? And maybe we don't have this data, maybe it's a gut feeling, but at least we'll try to have this conversation. At the same time, second part of this one, there might be, I'm not, I'm not wearing CEO's hat, but I'm a, a manager or a, a head of marketing because we don't have head of marketing, right? Then I'll be wearing that hat and making decision. Is it, well, you're a designer or product manager. Well, this is my responsibility as CMO, not the CEO, but CMO. And, and CMO would not do this way. So that's why I would override what you're saying because I'm responsible for, for this area. So distribution, trying to create boundaries around areas of responsibilities and just assigning people who owns what. Of course, there's gray zones and that's where the disagreements happen and misalignment is. One of the ways how founders become better is going to accelerators. So you mentioned already that you have also investors who have supported you with their yeah. know-how. You have uh, two accelerator experience, right? So we've been through Techstars. That's the accelerator. In the beginning, we got initial money, the first money ever from Incubator, which was basically Incubator. funding the idea. Uh, yeah. just Maybe they called themselves accelerator, but it was just like, we don't have nothing. They invested in us as the founders. Yeah. So what's your take when looking back? Is it worth for the early stage founders to go to an accelerator? Yes or no? And why? Well, it depends who the founder is. I would generally say, what's the value you're getting? Our value was, we're Latvians. We wanted to get into the United States. Uh-huh. We had zero connections. No one, not even relative there. So we, ha- we knew that we have to go to the United States and that, that was the conscious decision why we made that. If that's a decision for a founder to pick, should I go to Accelerate or yes or no? Is it because of the money? If it's only because of money, well, then it's only because of money. You don't will find enough value for that. But yeah, if you, there's cheaper money available. Yes, yes, but if you get value out of it, you see that... What's the value? You mentioned network. This is one value. Yes. And what's, what about the, the mentorship and the advice that you get? Fantastic. Getting? Yeah. It's, it's the best thing that... That's where we, we gather the most knowledge. So through Techstars, for example, we got uh, Google leadership coaches. Yeah. They helped us to resolve conflicts. They yeah. give us the scoring system. They help us prioritization. Yeah. Give these tools that are now day-to-day, which I'm thinking like, hey, that's the, how you run the company. But before Accelerator, before this kind of a learning experience without mentorship, I did not have these tools. Although I did read books and, and, yes. and whatnot, I did not have these tools on me. That, that's how we unlock the network. Of course, with the Techstars, it's always increasing network. And it's just not one-time experience, Techstars for life. Yes. And, and these tools, that's a, a big value. So for someone who needs either the network or the business know-how going to an accelerator makes sense. Does it make sense for someone who has been already building startups in the past? Let's say everything had folded, now started the new initiative, hasn't been an accelerator. Doesn't make sense. Does it make sense for such a person to go also to well, this if experience? Well, it, if it has strategic value to them, so let's say Techstars had creative programs, RGA, which is digital agency, or Disney, right? Like if you see there's partnership with potentially with Disney. Okay, yeah. but this is again connections. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but it makes sense, yes. And also you are now in the Cocoon program, which is yeah. not an accelerator, but still there's mentoring. I'm curious to hear why are you there and what's the uh, difference if you would compare this mentoring, that mentoring. So, so, so I think being cautious and being mindful, that's one thing that I learned about ourselves. If we know who we are, what's our mind state, that's very important for us. Can we make conscious decision or can we not? Are we just daydreaming? We're just in the stride, we're running, running, building, building. Google leadership coaches gave us these tools and they opened up this eyes that, hey, you know, there's this thing called you and there's personal development and that you can continuously work on yourself. And after the program ended, we had this, well, we want this to continue. Actually, we, we searched for it. There was no resources in, in 
or trusted resources in Europe. And since we found Cocoon, that's like, hey, finally, that exactly what we were looking for. But get all the values from, from uh, Ray Dalio's to radical transparency, to principles, how to operate, to behavioral, to various tools, that's what we see in the mentorship programs and, and mentors. And the, that's why we have mentors today. And I encourage everyone to have mentors. Even though you think that you're the smart ass, that's even the better reason why you need the mentor, because you're not. And, and I strongly encourage everyone to, to have, a, have a mentor, to learn things, to, to be better, to be a better leader, to be, be a better husband at, at home. Hmm. You mentioned husband. How is a mentor connected with being a better husband? So everything's connected. It's not like work and life, it's work life. And there's a balance. If I work longer, like I remove one hour of my time or couple, two hours of my time with my wife, how to have this conversation, how to understand, how to have this empathy within a family, what should be my role, and just to realize that, and that's what I'm still learning, how to be, how to find the balance. But I think this is, this is the open conversation to have and realize why do you do what you do? Do you want to be in your job nine to five, or is like, all 24 seven, right? And how do you find the balance between yourself, your family and kids? So that's very important to find this kind of a balance because what happens in your family results in your business and what happens in your business results how you like- Affects the family. Affects the family directly. This work, family and um, personal life balance is a topic in almost all founder conversations. I mean, what's your take on it? And, and I, I think there's no one who, who has the perfect answer or perfect example, <laughs> but we, we, everyone has their own approach to this. What, what is your approach? And maybe you, you can share some tips or best practices for which work for you. I don't know. All I, mistakes I, to avoid uh, yeah, <laughs> from you on Arsenal. So definitely sleep during nights. That's one thing that I can recommend, even though sometimes we're in Latvia and we have to work in US time zones. Yeah. Just Find time to, for yourself. That's my recommendation, at least for me <laughs> and, and people who want to get things done. That's very important. Yeah, have a healthy balance of sleep and exercise and then spending some time with your loved ones. And of course, work. Uh, if, you'll, if you'll do these things right, you'll have some plenty of time to, to, to work. But find a balance. I haven't found one, so to be honest. I'm still looking for what's the best regime, what's the rhythm? Because I have to chat with the customer, I have to be fast and responsive. That's, that's, that's my Achilles heel right now. I have to be better here. Mm -hmm. I've heard some also more radical stories where the founders try to reduce the workload so that they spend even like maybe 20, 30 hours at work and then a lot of time at home. I personally do not support this approach. I think that for the family, what matters is, of course, to have these hours together, but more important is that the hours that you have together, you have in good quality. Yeah, indeed. Sometimes it, you can, hey, I will save time and work only nine to five because I want to have time for myself. Do it. That's a good business. Probably not the startup. Because in the early days, what you have that nobody else has, at least your competitors, is, is time. You can outwork everyone. And at least that's why I, I know how many team members have our competitors. They're definitely five times bigger than our team. You can never outwork them in terms of hours, right? But in terms of our attitude, we can. Attitude, right. And, and the smartness of yes. the things that you do. Yeah. I know it's not long term. Yeah, we have to sacrifice yeah. a lot of things. And we are very open-minded about that. And sometimes we have to say to ourselves, you know, I made a lot of sacrifice for the last two, two years. Let me have a one week break yeah. at least, right? That's, that's okay. I have to, I have to have some time for myself, but I'm not saying that you have to work all the time, but just be mindful of that. So you mentioned also competitors and uh, also moving to the conclusion of our conversation. I want to ask from uh, this angle that let's suppose I'm one of your potential clients. I work in a big company promoting a consumer brand in an industry. And then I may think, okay, there are these new ways how to engage with the audience, with the 
I understand you are mostly targeting younger audiences, Gen Z, and then there's monetizer, and then there's some other choices, or maybe let's not do any choices. If this is your chance to speak to this person, what would you, and, and let's imagine you are in a cafe having coffee together. <laughs> Easy. What, what do you tell to them? You, you know, what do you ask them? When, when I was in Omnicom as account director, I was buying ads as cheaply as possible. And typically brand advertisers spend money in television, radio, internet. Now internet is like digital, social, etc. But in fact, there's audience in gaming. There's much more audience in gaming, in specific, specifically to Gen Z and millennials. They don't watch television anymore. Okay, now this is so clear, that's, but that's, that's why the you, that's why the you, the monetizer, compared to your competitor. Well, easy. Our engagement rates are 50x higher than anyone else on the market. So just let's start the conversation with this number, 50x. Our average engagement rate is 31, percent and that's a door opener. And then we can understand. What are the business objectives, what they want to do? Do they want to collect first party user data, emails, signups? Yeah, we can help to do that in a gaming environment with respect to iOS 17, GDPR, in compliance with everything and deliver direct value to them, just collect data, understand their consumer and drive the prospects to them. So if those are top of mind, then we should have a conversation. Okay, these are the outcomes of something that is behind it. And knowing you and your co-founder through our work and interviews, I feel that what is behind is that you have heart in what you are doing. Oh. <laughs> because there are also companies who do it for, only for the money. Uh, but I sense that you have heart in this whole thing that you are doing. And this, uh, I think, is important aspect even for companies of any size to collaborate with those who have heart in what they do. We're definitely humble, so we will not brag that, hey, we have a heart. We, will, we would love that our customers say that we have a heart. And in doing. fact, that, that you're saying so, that, yeah, you know, I agree on that for sure. Why some of our early customers love us is because of the relationships that we have built with them. Not because of, yeah, all, also about our product, yeah, hell yeah, but also because of people. With every single game studio, every investor, some of the investors have reinvested money in monetizer. And that's because of, heart as you said yeah so thank you for that yeah it it comes from the heart (laughs) (laughs) awesome okay thank you andy for the conversation thanks so much for inviting me pleasure being here